the unintended consequence of that, I, I forgot to press record on this for later, so I'm pressing it now. So the unintended consequence of teachers um, teaching everything on the test has been students who look to the classroom um, to be the sole place of learning and that everything they everything that they're supposed to know and learn will come by a teacher in, the, in a classroom. So you're fighting up against that current that's already set, which you've already established. One, have you, have you, have you ever tried, um, and you may have in the beginning, and now I know you're kind of in the middle of the class now, making students aware both verbally and also in a written format of what, what college, what your expectations are in terms of their roles and your role. That my role as an educator is that I'm going to teach you in class, but what you're going to get in class is only a portion of what you need to go, of what you need to do. Your role is to take what we've done in class and to apply it in the ways that I lay out outside of class. Um, no, that's a very good point. I will do that. I, to, I tell them they need to do their homework, but I have to also stress that they have to use everything outside of class, you know, to use to build their life. Okay. And I've, not, I've noticed that, I guess it was last fall, we had the first group of students who were totally taught under No Child Left Behind. Yes. And these students were absolutely the worst I've ever had. <laughs> they were absolutely the worst. They were not. They were not self-motivated. They were not self-directed. They were not. Um, I'm not going to blame anything. But I'm just going to say this is a consequence of like, which is what you said. Uh huh. Instead of um, uh, being uh, dis teaching decision making, they taught you teach to follow, you teach for the test. Yes. And we need to teach decision making in our elementary, middle, and high schools. So, so one way, so I can get to high schools. I've started working with some high schools more recently and found some really re receptivity with teachers. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But one of the things is, um, is helping. So a couple of things. One, if, you, if you're taking notes, one, one step I would do is to, since you're already in the middle of a class, redefine the roles. And okay. Um, okay. if you were in the beginning of the session, I would say you want to define the roles very explicitly in the outset. And here's an analogy, Donna, that may help you um, understand the, the value of doing this. Okay. If you, if you think about us in our in relationships, whether it be in marriage or in other kind of relationships or even in your job, the clearer, you know, I know Adrian just started there at MCC, the clearer your the expectations are. In terms of, I know exactly what you want from me and what exactly I'm supposed to produce. And I know your role from my role. For instance, Adrian has to know where her job duties stop and start from Gilletta's duties, where they start and stop, so on and so forth. Then it, it makes it much easier for us to sort of fulfill our duties and our role. Students, you know, at the heart of, the, of, of education is a relationship between the educator and the students. And students, just like in our personal relationship, they come with a lot of baggage and we come with a lot of baggage to that relationship. And so that past is going to influence how they see you as an educator, not only the past high school experience, but if there are other colleagues at MCC who are teaching in ways that they don't have to do anything outside of class, then they're going to assume that, oh, this is what's expected in your classroom as well. And so you have to be very explicit, both in writing in their syllabus. And when I say in writing in their syllabus, I mean, put it in the syllabus, but don't uh, don't leave it for them just to, to find it. You have to point it out in the okay. syllabus. Okay, this part, now this would be in the beginning of the year. You would say, now let's maybe spend a day and go over the syllabus. This is the syllabus. This syllabus is an important document because it's going to lay out the expectations and the outcomes that I have for you and for this course. Now, I don't know if I've worked with you all with syllabus creation, but that's another topic. But it's very, if there's a great book that's called... Um, Oh, I can't think of the name of it now, but I will uh, before we finish. I think it's called Creating Classroom Syllabus uh, by Kathleen. I can't think of her last name, but anyway, um, 
talks about the importance and the value of creating really effective sil uh, a syllabi. Uh, so in addition to writing it, you want to point it out because if you don't point it out, students won't find it on the syllabus. They'll just look for the test dates and things like that. And then also you want to tell them verbally in class. Um, and if you even want to go a step further, make them repeat it. My role as an educator is to do what? And your role as a student is to do what? And then let them know up front that this is going to be different. Now, I understand that for 12 or 13 years, this you have probably have not done, you probably have not done much of this. But the, this is what you need to do now. And then the second point, so that's one point, is making it explicit verbally and uh, in, written, in written language. The second point is to try to connect it back to why it's important. So that's the what they're going to do. The higher order thinking, the next level of understanding is why this is important. And you already hit on it, Donna. When you leave here, in order to advance in, in a job, in order to perform your duties well in a job, you're going to have to be able to think independently. You're going to be able to have to take information in this information age and grapple with it yourself and make decisions. And if I do it all for you, I do you a disservice. Great. Thank you. So it's just very important that we uh, redefine the roles for them so that now if they don't do it, Donna, we know that they have explicitly made a decision to not do it. Yes. As yes. opposed to it being lost in the sort of just the malaise of just continuing going to school, thinking that I'm going to do the same thing just at a different location that they've been doing all their life. Great. Thank you. Another another step further, and this is just another option, is to um, have them like type up a small contract. You can even some some teachers actually do this together with their class. And you may have done this before where you have like a short contract. Either you have it prepared or you have it semi prepared and they fill it in themselves. And then you uh, have them sign about what your roles are as an educator. This is what I'm going to do. And this is what you're going to do. Can we agree as a class that this is how you're going to use? This is how I'm going to operate. This is how you're going to operate individually. And when we do group stuff, that this is how you're going to operate with your classroom. So you're cre with your classmates. So you're creating this kind of community together that we're in this together. Good, good idea. Yeah. Good so idea. That, that, that's another option that uh, some folks have used. And the other thing uh, you mentioned is the uh, another step. You can call this step the forewarning. And the forewarning is you simply making them aware that one in, in advance, one place where I know that, that students typically struggle is finding time in their schedule to do the work outside of class. Um, so I would encourage you up front already to set aside time. It's going to take you X amount of time. I can't tell you the exact number because it's going to depend on you know, where you are in, in the learning curve. However, it is going to take time outside of class. So it's going to be very important that you set this outside of class. So that's the next one. The next option is forewarning. And then finally, I would say another option is what I would call the reminder. And the reminder will be simply reminding them why they're there. You're here because you want to be at a higher level. You don't want to do the same thing. You obviously have high asp aspirations of yourself. You have goals for yourself because a lot of people aren't where you are. Some people just go to high school. Some people don't finish high school. Here you are continuing on. So because you have those aspirations, you need to make it a priority to uh, to set set time, um, set, set aside time to meet your goals. And I always emphasize that last part, that these are your goals. So you help help transfer that ownership that you're not you're not doing this for me. You're doing this for you, your family, your future, whatever it is may be. Um, so that's another uh, way you want to remind them of that. Great. Thank you. And that, that's probably as good to get students to articulate why they're in class. Yes. You get a feel for them if they tell you that my mom made me go. My placement test put me here. I want to be X, Y, and Z, or I want to finish 
that so you get to assess who's in your class. Like how many people are serious? Because not everyone is in is uh serious, particularly if you're in a course you're made to be in because of some kind of requirement. Yes. You need to be in there even though you may have no interest in the subject because it sounds like a lot of students, some of them have no interest at all in the academic process. They're sort of just here because mm -hmm. um, it was the next thing to do. <laughs> or somebody no. told them. And feeling that out and then trying to convince some of them, you may not be able to convince all of them, but while you're here, what kind of benefit? And even if you're, you're not here for any good good reason necessarily, but how do you change that, help them to change that and see how they can benefit from attending school? There's, there's an awareness doing is their responsibility. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, Adrian, Adrian, Adrian that, that, that's, that's a great point. In fact, um, what I would say is um, you kind of handle this. Don't allow, usually in a classroom setting, and I've asked this every time, and most people tend to agree, you're not going to have everyone, or not even the majority of students are going to be um, abusing the class or not wanting to be there. But the tendency is that we tend to focus on those because they're so obvious. Mm -hmm. And so it's important to try to make sure that you keep it in perspective that, you know, if I have a class of 30 and I have, you know, five students who don't do anything, don't show up for everything, and they seem to consume the most of my, you know, they seem to draw the most negative energy from me, that, you know what, there's another 20 students or 25 students who are at least moderately to maybe highly interested in what I'm doing. And so it kind of helps us keep perspective. And the other thing yeah. is even with those five students or so who aren't as interested, you know, one of, one of the beauties about education is that you never know when students have a turnaround moment. You know, I don't think I shared much when I was there, but I remember when I was, when I went to college, I was actually, I was a uh, student athlete and I, identified solely as an athlete in college. Um, I was the first in my family to go to college. I never really uh, considered uh, myself as a student necessarily. I consider myself as a football player who was in college. And I sat in classes as my, my early years in college with my headphones on, with a hoodie on, sitting in the back of the class, making everyone know that I was not going to be going to participate in that class but you know over time the environment and certain professors uh they made an impact on me and i give you one quick story i don't want to take up the time sharing my story but i think this may be may be encouraging and inspiring about the impact that that you probably have on your students that you may not know about but uh professor william monty who actually just passed away uh last year he invited me to be a part of this leadership program, um, and as part of the program, you had to take you had to take a um, like a uh, great books reading course, and it was with all these students who were you know gra graduating top of the class, and I was kind of middle of the road student, um, and he asked me to be a part of it, and at first I just planned on not going because I'm thinking that's not me. I came here to play football. I'm not going to do all this other stuff. And um, just somehow, maybe maybe Providence or something, I ended up um, going on this trip that they invited me to go on. And from there, I ended up enrolling into this great books class, which I was the only African American, and I was the only, uh, and I was the uh, definitely the oddball in the sense that all these people were graduating top of the class, and I was kind of middle of the road, maybe slightly above middle of the road, and. Um, I ended up really making a turnaround in that class. I ended up making the dean's list and going on to grad school and making, you know, pretty much straight A's throughout grad school and kind of going on the, the path I've been on now. But had that not happened, I, mean, I don't know if that, if Professor Monty realized the impact that he had at that time, but that simple thing of keeping the door open, so to speak, and not sort of giving up on me because my attitude, I probably deserve to be given up on. <laughs> to be honest, but it made a big difference. So never underestimate your power and your influence, even over those students who are at the bottom, but at the same time, don't let those students who are, when I say at the bottom, I mean those who are not 
willing or seeming to be be responsive to uh, to the educational environment, don't let them pull you down at the same time. Oh, yeah, that's, that's great. Yes, because we tend to focus on those few. Yes, thank you. So anyway, that some of those may help you um, make students more tuned. You may have to revisit those throughout the semester because you know students. Oh, sure. Like like we all do, they get out of whack a little bit, and things go kind of kind of crazy. So, what other areas would you like to uh, discuss, or Adrian, if you have anything that you've heard? Well, I was going to say we're starting an academic coaching program, kind of okay. started here. And what would you think of um, like what if Donna Donna's saying her students say they don't have time, so then am I managing your time well? Yeah. For us doing an integrated activity. Um, that would, you know, with her students in her class on time and homework. Because if they never turn in their homework, they're going to lead toward a certain grade in the classroom. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much that's going to become evidence on the test. There's going to be some evidence um, on their quizzes soon. Um, the thoughts on, like, integrating, um, either a time management, a study skills sort of, piece in with the math to help students organize and, and help them to come to a point of realizing they do have time and this is how they make the time in order to do this. Okay, so my thoughts are probably a little different on that. So the counselor in me says two things. One is I would try to decipher if students, by because oftentimes people say one thing but mean another for a variety of reasons. And so I would try to figure out if they really are saying they don't have time because they believe they don't have time or if they're saying they don't have time as sort of another way of saying that I tried to do the work. It took too much time. Therefore, I don't have time. Don't have time. You know, yeah, I don't want to, I just don't want don't want to do it. Well, well not, necessarily I don't, I not, not, not necessarily I don't want to do it. I, I would say. Um, I was talking to some, I was working with a local high school uh, last week and we were discussing this very thing. And she said that she would, this was actually an AP class in high school. And she said, I have so much trouble getting the students to do the homework, getting them to do the homework. They won't do it. And I said, and so we started talking and she said, well, what they'll say is they'll, they'll, when they, when I sign it, they all plan to do it but they'll go back and try to do it at home and they'll come back the next day and say, oh, I didn't do it. I couldn't do it. I tried it, but I couldn't do it. So I'm just trying to distinguish, are your students saying they don't have time because they attempted to do the homework and it, they didn't know how to do it successfully. So they just said, oh, I don't have the time to, to figure this out, so to speak. Like, are they at least making an attempt? Do you know that? Yeah, they are making an attempt. Yeah, okay. they are. So so that's similar to the situation that I encountered. So what that could mean is this. Now, this is where my, this is my wheelhouse here. This is what I get really excited about is that what could be going on is in class. They are recognizing if we go to the different levels of, of thinking, going from the most surface level of memorization, they see you maybe working through the problems in class. And when you're doing it, it makes sense. Because, of Absolutely. course, you're good at it. They see you doing it. Oh, I get that. Okay, great. And then when they go home and they try to do it, it doesn't work out so well. And so then yeah. they, they struggle for a little bit on their own independently. And maybe they haven't developed the – or they, maybe they just figured that, you know, I can't figure this out. Why waste the time? And then they stop. Is, does that sound like what may be going on? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So in that case, what I would do then is I would – and you may already do this, but it's very important that you don't uh, do the work for them. So, for example, when I was at this high school, I was asking this teacher, um, we were talking about getting her students to score higher on the AP exams that they're going to have to take. And she said, you know, Lenard, I ended up, make a long story short, she was explaining how she goes through and she sort of takes out uh the various parts of, a, it was AP U.S. history, how she kind of breaks it down for them and and... And in, in short, what, I, what she ended up recognizing was that she was like, I'm doing all the thinking for them. I'm basically doing all the evaluation of what's important, what's not, not, what's not important, what they have to do, so that then when they go to do it on their own, they haven't developed the muscles, so to speak, the thinking skills 
on their own, they view, they're using the ones that I've given them. And so in class, Donna, do you allow them time to work through the problems themselves? Um, not enough. Okay. I have to do that more. And I know it's probably frustrating because you want to get through to other things. Yes. But, but if you, that's very, it's very important. I, yeah, I, I want to do that every class period now, at least twice a week. Yeah, Maybe okay. three times a week, but twice a week I can do that. So, and you can do this in groups. You can do this in um in in other ways, but and you don't have this doesn't have to take up your 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 whole class. But what you want to do is you want to um to go ahead and work through the problem maybe as a model, and then allow them to work through the problem and allow them to talk amongst each other as they work through the problem. And you kind of walk around and monitor. I saw this. I'll give you this very clear. A uh, practical example, because this uh, Angie Rupert at Caldwell Community College, I sat in on her class recently and she did this perfectly. So I found the uh, my notes here from her session. If you don't mind me going through this, I think this will be helpful to you. Oh, sure. Uh, she, she was doing a um, she was talking about distribution. Di uh, I'm sorry, distributing. Yeah. Do, do you teach that as well? Distributive property, yeah. Okay, well, she she was talking about that and kind of a quick run through of what she did in the notes that I observed. Now, Adrian, have you shown Donna the um, the most recent um, Learn World projects? Um, oh, what are they? The uh, little just sent me. yes, the sticky note money things. I brought that with me. Okay, so if you can show her that, so she'll know what I'm referring to when I bring that up. So. I'll let you get those out. Let me know when you're ready. Okay. You ready? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's uh, it's one for each, right? Um, yeah. You don't have to bring out all of them, just so she'll have a reference point when I'm talking about them. Okay. 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 So she was talking yeah. about she was talking about di distributing, and what she did was she started off the class helping them see examples helping them connect examples from real life about distri distributing. So she talked about food, banking, pharmacy, about how, distrib how distribution and distributing is used in those areas. And then she talked about how, um, and then she used those uh, real world examples. And then as she did it, she, she had students come to the board and would do problems and she pointed out the thinking levels that they were using in the problems. So initially they started out and they were using very memory based thinking levels. They were just kind of applying from their memory what they saw her do. And she um, she would then walk. She um, she would hand out different monetary, different uh, sticky note values of the of the loan well money, uh, hi highlighting. Uh, that core, I'm sorry, that corresponded to the level of thinking that they were using while they were doing the problem. So if a student came up and they were kind of remembering a problem, just the steps of a problem, then she would give them the $5. If a student came up and then she had this sort of sequenced out and they were applying knowledge to a problem uh, from, uh, you know, from something else, then she would give them the applying uh, sticky note. And what I saw happen is it transformed her class to where these students, adults, were 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 competing over who could think the highest level because they were wanting to get more money. And and so they were they were coming up, and as she was assigning them, giving them these sticky notes, they were they were getting really into it. And then um, and so then she took that and she walked around, which I think was very important. She walked around the room and as they were um, working in their group, she would hand them sticky note money, depending on how they were inter interacting with, uh, with the material. Uh, let me see what else I have. I said the money seemed to motivate students, even the students who sat in the back of the room. Um, she had them come to the board and create problems and the class work through the answers for money. And those who came up with the problem, who wrote on the board, they received the five hundred dollars because they had to. It came a point where where they had to, um, they had to actually, when you know, they had to create their own problem that wasn't in the book out of their mind, and then they had to come up and solve that problem. 
and um and she would give them five hundred dollars the highest level creating because they were creating this problem and they, it helped create a value to them of of this high level thinking process that they were engaged in um what else oh another very important thing she did was in her notes that she gave the students she had the corresponding uh textbook pages that they would find that information and she would she would strategically refer back to the PowerPoint, I mean, back to the um, the actual book when she was teaching. So the students would connect that, oh, I can learn more about this in the book if I go get, if I, if I use my book. So again, that's just another sort of subtle, but I think effective way of making them understand that even when I'm not here, you're not in my class, you have the book. The book can be a useful resource to you. So she um, essentially had them use their book in classroom with her versus you don't use it. Oftentimes you may not use the book in classroom, but you're using the book at home, and then they really hadn't read or cracked it open yeah. good and all of that. Okay. Yeah. Adrian, I'm glad you brought that up because actually the professor that I was talking about at my institution, one of the things that started us talking was, was he was saying that his students don't use the textbooks. And if you look at my last article, he actually posted some questions on there, and we were talking about okay. – the questions. But one of the things that I told him is the reason students, when I meet with students, one of the primary reasons students don't use textbooks, I'm glad you brought that up, Adrian, is because if they don't see the professor using the textbooks, then they assume that they don't need to use the textbooks. Because they figure that, hey, if I've had students say oftentimes, they'll say, oh, I'll say, well, do you use your book? And they'll say just matter of factly, oh, we don't need the book in my class. My professor doesn't use the book. And I'll say, but did your professor have a book in the syllabus that you're supposed to get? Oh, yeah. But, but you know, she or he never uses it, so we don't need it. And I'll have to tell them, I'll say, well, the book is a resource for you, not for your professor. Your professor uses the book probably outside of class, preparing for class, has used the book for a number of years, so that book is in their head. However, the book is a tool for you. And every time I say that and just make that very explicit for students, they always look at me like, really? I never really realized that. Yeah, I, I have, I tell my students sometimes to read their math book out loud. Okay. And then to copy the examples. And then that, that kind of helps them understand the thinking processes of the writers so that when they do their, their work, they can also use that, kind of go through that. But it, mm -hmm. it helps to read the it helps to read the book out loud. I know it. I know that that helps them do this. So maybe in your case, if they're they're doing that in class, the textbook out loud. No, at home. At home. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 But but the, the key thing is they. If you, uh, the key thing that I think um, this. <laughs> what would you say? I'm sorry. No, I was asking Donna if they use it. If she does that in class. Oh, okay. You know, for out of class, it's out loud. Yeah. Well, that's why I was pointing out. The, the key thing that this uh, professor, this instructor did at, uh, at this community college was she explicitly and I think strategically pointed out where the information that she was talking about was located in the book. And, and she didn't spend a lot of time on it, to be honest, because I think she didn't want to use all of her time going through the book. But she just simply had on the notes because she she gave me handouts of her notes that she gave them as well while I was in there. And, and we had met beforehand because she had I, I did a training at her school and and she had came she come to visit me at my school and we talked about uh, some things that she could do and so she wanted me to see how she was doing it and give her feedback and so she actually had you know for certain parts of uh, distributed properties she would have the book pages the book page numbers associated with that particular uh, topic in their notes and then periodically as she taught she would refer to that in their book. Again, just another way of passing along the message to them that's very different than what they typically bring is, okay, this stuff is in your book. You need to use your book. So it's a subtle way of doing that. Then she, um, um, let me see, she had students stand, oh, she had students, one thing she did I thought was really useful, she had students stand up and physically move uh, to grouping, to groups, and then she had them sort of she sorted them like by color she had another student sort them by color by type by all these other things and she used that in her lesson so she created this sort of experiment in her room 
to help them see how they're already sorting things and how a lot of times in, dis in distributed properties you're sorting and how you how you are kind of can use those same principles and practices that you're using already you can use that in this class as well uh what else did she do here in my notes um she she discouraged her students from guessing which i thought but she did it in a very positive way and um she and the way she did that was when they would start guessing she would tell them okay Let's think about the answer. Let's think about how you come to your answer. And so encouraging them to that, you know, it's not just what comes into your head. It's the process of how you're coming to these answers. Um, what else? Let me see. Oh, good, good, good. When they were when when things were right on the board, she would ask them why they agreed that it was right. So she didn't just settle for them saying, "Oh, okay, it's right, it's right," and moving on. Because oftentimes students will come to the right answer, but as you know, the right answer isn't going to help you at home, right? <laughs> Knowing the right answer isn't going to help you. It's that the process of getting to the right answer is what's important. And so, um, and so she would point that out to them, and she would she would um, this helped them move beyond simply knowing what to do and push them towards explaining why they had to know this and why why the answer um, is what it, um, became what it was. Uh, what else? Um, you know, today, I, I think a lot, of, a lot of teachers use in a lot of textbooks that they did not have a number of years ago. Yes. Um, to, I mean, you mentioned the notes from the, the teacher mm -hmm. giving the students. So the students have these textbooks, and they also have these websites, and they also have these PowerPoints, and yeah. they also have teacher notes. Yes. And a lot of times they aren't using any of these tools mm -hmm. um, effectively because I hear from like people in the uh, the humanities, social science sort of arena when they have the PowerPoints, they have they create all these PowerPoints, they create all these notes that. They're feeling like the students aren't even doing that. They might have a textbook, but they aren't even reading those notes. And because, uh, well, I, I guess students sort of have a mindset that if I have this PowerPoint, that takes care of me not reading the textbook, but neither do they really actively engage in the PowerPoint because they get it on the screen. There's no note page, there's, you know, for them to write out stuff. The PowerPoint oftentimes has a whole textbook page on it. <laughs> a lot of faculty members don't do PowerPoints very well. There's exactly a few right. things where they have to sort of fill in the blanks, fill in some learning process, not necessarily fill in the blank, but you know what I'm saying about taking notes yes. um, with that. And so, that sometimes is problematic, I hear, for faculty in those sort of disciplines. Yeah, um, I, 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 I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I'm going to say not just the disciplines where there's a lot of homework is a lot of practice. It's a lot of the, the homework is the, in the class is to read and then you may have to write a paper or you might have to write do a test, but there is no daily homework. So you go weeks without homework, unlike a math class or science class or class. So so Adrian, for those students. Yeah, so Adrian, so I hear this constantly and I think there are two things at fault here. So I think, and I'm, this is actually an article that I plan on writing in a couple of weeks, and the title of it is called Ineffective Interactions, How Faculty and Students Both uh, Frustrate Each Other. And, and one of the things that, um, that, I, that I recognize in working, and this is something that in your position and those who work with you, Adrian, in their positions will recognize, and it's very important that we ask the right questions to get to the heart of this. Yes. So... There, there are a couple of things happening. Both, I, I, I'm going to always defer to things that educators can do because I believe, for the most part, that educators control how things happen in the classroom. And oftentimes, the the problems that we see, and I know this may sound, this may be a painful pill to swallow, but the problems that we see are actually things that we can control or we should control and we just may not realize the role that we're playing in it. So that that can be uncomforting sometimes, but if people allow that kind of pill 
to, to if they swallow that pill, it could be very empowering because if you believe the students are the problem, then you're hopeless because you can't change the students. Mm-hmm. But if but if you if we begin to see how we have agency, how we can control some things, then we can uh, take more responsibility and then we can actually control the dynamics. It's the whole locus of control situation. If I believe I control things, then I have an internal locus of control and I have more power. If I believe that externally something else is controlling things, well, then I feel powerless, which is how a lot of educators feel. And I think they don't need to feel that way. So saying that, here are a couple of things that I think that educators unknowingly do wrong in those classes you're mentioning. And I've, I've observed this several times. One, they abuse PowerPoint. And they oftentimes will have, so they make themselves irrelevant. So think about it. Let's go back into the mind of a student. If I'm a student and I go to your class, Adrian, and you give me a PowerPoint that has everything that I'm supposed, that I believe, and oftentimes I've heard professors say that my PowerPoints, you know, my tests come from my PowerPoint, so to speak. And so you, you give me that and I go to your class. Why do I need you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. If your test, if you told me that your test come from the PowerPoint and you've given me the PowerPoint, why do I need you? So they all, they, they sort of make themselves irrelevant by giving students the PowerPoint and teaching the PowerPoint. If you're going to give students a PowerPoint, don't teach the PowerPoint. Um, Teach, use the PowerPoint as a platform for teaching other stuff so that you're not making yourself unknowingly irrelevant to students. Um, Another role situation here is students have to understand that when they get the PowerPoint, they need to they need to go over the PowerPoint before class, assuming that they may get it before class. Like, don't wait to come to class and then go for the PowerPoint afterwards, which is what most students do. If they can access the PowerPoint early, go over the PowerPoint before class, gain a familiarity with the things we're going to be talking about. If there are chapters to read the book, read the book and then come to class and you'll you'll benefit much more from the class. And the way I tell students is, hey, I don't want to waste your time. This is going to help you get the most out of your time. If you come prepared you're going to um, get more from your professor so that you're going to have to do less on your own. And I, I have a question. I have a question for you. Excuse me. This may be off the point, but what, what, are you, what are your feelings about online learning, online classes, and online education? I, I, I'm, to be honest, I'm still forming an opinion about that. I don't think... Ideally, I mean, in terms of, oh, I guess let me clarify. Do you mean what do I think about its effectiveness or what do I think about yeah. ways to make it better? I mean, I mean, supposedly we're going to there. We're going towards online learning. Yes. I feel that you, you have it has to be more blended. You can use, you have to be in the class, but you can use the online for, for enhancement. Well, for this... But, well, for this particular math class that I was at at this community college, they were in the Emporium method, and she taught one seated class and one that was, you know, the Emporium where you don't do anything with the students. You're just there. Do you know what I mean by when I say Emporium method? Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Okay, so from what I understand, correct me if I'm wrong, that these students are taking classes on a computer and the professor is just there in the background. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I, I can definitely... definitely I can definitely tell you that those students who were in that Emporium method are not going to get the same educational experience that the students in the class did. No, yeah, I haven't taken a variety of online classes. Um, I decided to dive into that to see what that was like. Um, what would you think? I took them at the community college level while working at community college, and I took them in graduate, at a graduate school level. I got some grad certificates. Um, online is just like face to face, different modes of instruction, different involvement, different interactions. So it's not a one size fit all in how people teach online um, class classes. But one thing I can say as an online student, I actually do like it um, because of its convenience. Mm-hmm. Like I would not want the online for me. I would not want the online class that would make me act like I'm a face-to-face student. Yeah. I gotta dial in at that. And that's so you wanted, a- so you wanted asynchronous. Yeah. 
So you want an asynchronous class? Yes. Um, however, a, online is not for many students because not many students are ready to manage and understand the time. People don't do it well in the face-to-face -face setting. Um, they, a lot of them really don't do it well in the online format because you, you're not, it's not less work. By no means is online less work at all. It almost feels like less work because there is no teacher standing in front of you. Mm -hmm. You need to put the FaceTime, what you would have put in the FaceTime, plus what you would have put in your homework like you were going to class. And a lot of people don't see online as that. And therefore, they don't manage their time the same in order to do it for many online courses. Um, so, so, Adrian, you bring, you bring up a great point because someone like you, highly intelligent, educated, self-motivated, have no problem with online. Someone like me, in fact, I may prefer an online class for the very reasons you mentioned. My wife currently actually is in an online master's program and she's gotten hundreds in every, every class she's taken so far. Um, and she's learned a lot from the process. I, I can definitely say that she's grown, she's learned, she's gotten a lot of the benefits, maybe even same as she would have gotten if she was, if she was actually going to a seated class. But I do agree with what both of you are saying. But for other students who may not be as yet in their life, they may get here, but they may not be as self-motivated. They may not be as metacognitively aware to be able to navigate their own thinking and learning. Yeah. I think online could be very intimidating and could be very, um, um, it could, could be a not, big failure. Yeah, it could not be a big match for them. Yeah. Yeah. Because no matter, most students, I mean, it's, it's a rare student that at some point does not get lazy during yes. the semester. <laughs> but every, whatever the term is, yeah. at some point you get a little tight. Yes. And you slack off. But it's how do you get back up on your game um, that a lot of people don't know how to do? Because in one of my online classes, I decided I didn't. It was the homework was overwhelming. Mm -hmm. uh, it was it was actually one of the community college classes, uh -huh. and I said I don't need to do all this homework. I can accomplish. <laughs> you know, I can accomplish these tests. I started cutting out doing the homework. If I was going to take something on, I looked at my little points and see. Where was that going to have the least impact? And I took it off the homework. I did not do all of them. What I went, but, but I had that skill. I went for going to do some medium, easy, and challenging homework questions. But I had the skill to pick those out. Yes. And if students, like the example you gave for the faculty member with the distributed property, going around showing them at what levels of thinking they are, if they don't kind of get that concept, they'll never be able to think, and they typically don't go for the challenging questions. And in the, the world of tutoring, that kind of learning support, we hear that, oh, the teacher, when I went to the test, it was like a whole nother world. Yes. They hadn't gone to any deeper level thinking. They thought all the class was one thing and the test was another. Yes. And they don't make the connection between the two. So I was able to do that in order to take the quiz and the test without doing all the homework. I, yeah. I had to be selective because I just... It became insurmountable. <laughs> but, 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 but Adrian, if I may pause you and point out something that I think needs to be pointed out that you're doing that I think people don't recognize, what you are able to do, what you're articulating is you were able to determine the outcomes you needed to reach and recognize that the homework for you wasn't the best route to get there. That for you, you knew how to get that outcome. But like you said, very few students can do that. I'm the same way. Some people assign homework for busy work. I'll give you a clear example. I'm working, I was working with an undergraduate student who, um, who came to my office because he was, he was uh, put on academic, I think he got an academic, he was put on academic probation actually at our school. He comes into my office and he's very respectful, but you can tell he's kind of, has a little bit of, disengagement to him, whatever. And so I start talking with them and I say, so tell me, like I always do, I say, so tell me what's going on. It seems like you struggled in a few classes. Uh, tell, tell me what's going on. And as he started talking, I can tell, okay, this kid's not dumb. This kid's not dumb. What's going on here? And so as he's talking, I say, well, would you tell me. Instead, I didn't even go over all of my strategy stuff that I usually go over with students. I just listened to him talk. And after about 10 minutes, I said, okay, 
tell me why did you do poorly in these classes? Because he had some very difficult classes he was in that he did really well in. And then he had some other classes that weren't as difficult that he struggled in. And so I said, why did you fail these classes? And he said, I didn't go. I just didn't go to class. I didn't do the work. And I said, why didn't you do the work? He said, well, because this professor wanted, he was assigning us reading every night and we'd have to take notes on the reading and he would grade our notes. And he was like, I don't need that. And I was like, what do you mean? He said, I know how to read. I can comprehend my stuff. And he, he figured out that this was for, this was a tool to get students who were less likely to read, to get them sort of to hold them accountable for reading. And, and so th this kid was saying, I just, he didn't use these words. He said, I just found it pointless. I just found it like being in middle school of having someone stand over me and tell me to take notes on something. He said, look, if he would give me the test or give me the thing, I would show that I can do that, but he didn't do that. And so I just stopped going to class because I felt like it was a waste of my time. So after he left, and I'm not saying this is always an indicator, but after he left, I was curious. And so I went and looked him up in our academic system the kid has like a super SAT score, super um, ACT score, very bright, did super well in high school, and he's on academic probation. And the reason is because like what you said, the homework was pointless to him. He could pass the test. He just didn't want to do all the busy work. Yeah, I, I found out what, what did I need to pass the test and did not do the busy work because I felt like that was like a high school class with all that homework in it. I was like, my goodness, my now I see what these students are talking about. So when I took the classes at community college, it was to put myself in the shoes of, of the adult student um, with the family, with the full-time job, with other things going on. How do I manage and succeed in school? What is it can I do? Because those students typically are either going to look for the short court to look for the out. Or, yeah, or and or they're going to look to find out what is it that I absolutely have to do in order to perform at whatever level they want to perform at, at this court in this class. So that's why going back to Donna, what I was saying with you, that's why it's important to get them to understand that, yes, we're going to deal with material in this. But this class is also about advancing your thinking. And because one of the things that's very uh, pertinent to adult learners is that guess what? In the economy now, jobs that are called routine based jobs where you just memorize, those jobs are increasingly being done by computers and by in the future by more and more robotics. They're being mechanized. So that means that if all you can do with your mental functions is remember, you're, you're going to be increasingly competing with computers and with robots. And guess what? You don't want to compete with, with computers and robots because they can work for free and they can work forever. And so that means that the jobs at that level are going to be increasingly driven down. The, the wages are going to be concrete, uh, increasingly driven down. And so this is why you need to be able to think at these higher levels. This is why, in addition to knowing this algebra stuff that we're going over, which is important, by the way, it's important because you are going to use it in your life. But what's more important is that you learn how to think about these material complexly, because that's going to determine largely how much money you're going to make in your future. And of course, with adult learners, they're very focused on, you know, connecting this to a job absolutely yeah but but they need to understand that that's it's more than just thinking on higher levels just to be thinking on higher levels that there is a tangible uh financial um um per job um placement job advancement connection to what they're doing in the class and that's one of the reasons why i created that learn well money is to ever remind students that what you're doing, the mental functions that you're operating on have a value associated with them. And memory, it does have some valuable value to it. And it is important, but you want to be able to operate on these higher levels, on these deeper levels of thinking so that you can earn even more for your time. Great. Now, Lord, I know we're at 4 o'clock, we're at 5 after 4. I wanted to give Donna also... The diagram, the handout yes. where the um, additional sheets are. You want to? Yes. Let me show you a little bit about that. Let me show you how how you would use that. Let me let me get out of this screen here and go to this other thing.
So do you see that on the screen now? Uh, no, our screen went out. Your screen went out? Yeah. Let me press the button, it'll come back. It went, it went to sleep. Yeah. Um, it did a ding, so I was figuring it pulled out. Oh, shoot, yeah. How's it going now? Oh, there we go. Okay, great. Yeah, we got it. Oh, you see it? Okay, do you see the outcome variation activity? Yeah. Okay, so, so what you have in front of you is a recent document that I created to, um, to help educate. Actually, the high school teachers started doing this, and so I, I uh, saw her using it, and I said, man, this could be very useful. And so I did a session at her school, and then she adopted this. And so this is a way to get students to do things on their own, in addition to doing the work, helping them develop that metacognitive um, thinking ability, which is just as important as the content. In fact, research has shown that students who are more metacognitively aware will perform better on academic tasks. And you can tell your students this, that um, employees who are more metacognitively aware will advance further and faster in their career than those who are not. And it makes sense because metacognition is about understanding the goal that you have to reach and understanding where you are in the continuum of reaching that goal and how to navigate your way to it most efficiently. So if you think about in a job setting, the more you understand what your job is about and what's truly valuable about your job and what it is that you're supposed to be doing, and then the more accurately you can assess where you are in doing that, then the more likely you are to meet goals that supervisors or the organization has laid out and the more successful you're going to be. So again, this isn't just school stuff like students tend to think of it, but this is real, has real practical you know, implications throughout, throughout their lives. So, um, so let's look at this document over here at the, you, what you have is you have six levels of interaction. Let me bring my little tool up here so I can point around. Where is it? Where is that thing? There is a cursor that's moving around. Yeah, I'm trying to find, I'm trying to color the cursor, but I don't see oh, the option yeah. to do that on here. So uh, I may just have to use the cursor here. So, um, all right. So up, maybe I can use a color up here. Yeah. So um, in this area up here where I'm, where I'm kind of cursoring around up here, this is where you can put the content. So, for example, if you were talking about uh, what, what's a topic, Donna, that you might be talking about uh, in your classes coming up soon? Okay, we've got um, solving, solving rational equations. Okay, so solving rational equations. You can put that here and maybe if there's some specific steps or something, components to it, you can put that in this content area. Over here to, to the right of the screen where it says resources, that is something where you can then put the, the resources that they're going to use. This is them constructing their knowledge. You might put the textbook. Uh, you might put a specific part of the textbook. You might put notes, whatever it may be. Or handouts or something. Or, yes, yes. You want to just list those over there so they understand that, that this is the content over here on the left that we're dealing with. And these are the resources that you can use to build your knowledge about this content. And this is the first level, remembering, and you have six different levels that progressively go up from remembering all the way to creating. And so the idea behind this is to get students to understand when they're operating at various thinking levels and then when they're, how to change and transition to higher levels of thinking. So briefly, if you look over here where it says think well, learn well, interaction level, this is just goes along with the diagram and it just says the, uh, the metacognitive learning goal, this is for the remembering level, and then the Bloom's higher order thinking skills, and then the corresponding learning outcome. And so just uh, you'll kind of, I'm assuming that you kind of go over the diagram with them, help them understand the diagram, and then this is for them to actually do work here, student directed plan for success. So this is what, this is how you can help them direct their own learning. So the planning part, what are you attempting to do with the information you're studying? Okay, so this is where they need to make a plan. Think about it. Um, what was our topic again, Donna? 
solving rational equations? Okay, so it might be simply something as, um, okay, so we're going to, in the content section is solving rational equations. So on a remembering level, my simple thing might be, do I know, um, do I know what rational equations are? Do I know, yeah. can, I, can I define what a rational equation is? Okay. Right. And right. then, so here they might write, okay, so I am, uh, I'm going to define rational equations. Then the next level, they or you, whoever's working them through this, could then say, okay, uh, monitoring. What level are you thinking on? Okay, so what level am I thinking? I'm thinking about rational equations now as I, I'm reading my book. I just think, want to pay attention and become aware of how I'm thinking about it. And then at the end, which is the most important part that uh, they talk about students who are successful learners, they can accurately evaluate the outcome that they've reached. So at the end of that process, what do I know now? Okay, I know that rational um, equations are blah, 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 blah. Okay? Okay. So they have a Go definition. On. Then you switch down to the next uh, level, uh, which would be um, um, understanding. Do I have that on there? I mean, let, let, me, let me bring that up here. Um, I gave her. You yeah, gave her, I, her. I gave her. Okay, for the sake of time, just uh, just assume that this is understanding, and so the content would stay the same because this is all about them reaching different outcomes with the same content. It's helping them understand that if I think about this content one way, I could remember it, but I can also think about the same content and begin to understand it, so on and so forth. So now down here. What are you attempting to do in the planning part? Okay, now I need to understand why rational equations are important. Okay, I need to understand it. So I'm going to maybe read the book. My plan is I'm going to read the book. I'm going to look at the notes. But my plan is to figure out why rational equations are important. Now, this is much different from just knowing what they are. This is another component, another dimension of my learning that's figuring out why they're important. Okay, so then I'm going to monitor along the way. OK, what level am I thinking on? Am I still trying to figure out what rational equations are? Because that would be remembering. But now I'm on understanding. Or am I trying to figure out why rational equations are important or why a certain step is important in figuring out rational equations? However, it is you kind of control how they do that. And then at the end of that interaction, you can do this in class, possibly. What do I know now? Do I know why rational equations are important? Do I know why I might use this? Do I know uh, why this step, whatever, how it is you're um, interacting with them, why this step is important? So you go through that sequence with them, helping them understand that they're now grappling with the same information, but they're very deliberately changing their metacognitive and their thinking level to reach different outcomes. And so it's just continuously using that planning monitoring and evaluating and then as they go down now let's say you know over i don't know how long you envision doing this but um but at some point they're going to get down to where they can maybe analyze different types of rational equations one from another okay so when they do that now they're all the way down to analyzing you know um which is a very deep level of thinking and so it's important that they understand how they have advance their thinking and um, and kind of where that's led them. And now they'll be able to reach different outcomes. And so do you, do you get the point in kind of how to use this document? Yes, I do. Thank you. Yes. Do you think, do you think that could be something? How do you envision yourself using it? I envision um, the next section when we solve rational equations, I'm going to bring this out and, and I'm going to go through step by step with that. Okay. And I'm going to copy this and have them. Can, can I copy this for this? Yeah, yes. Okay. And then I will have them fill it out too. Good. Yeah, it'll be a good thing to show them an example first because they're yeah, not going to get it. I will yeah. do that. I will do that. And, yeah. and then have them to do certain yeah. things. Yeah. Now, I was thinking since you had this up on the screen, Lenard, I knew you had, the, the, you had created the paper version uh -huh. for students to do individually. But it would be good if there was an interactive version for um, that the teacher can pull oh. up on, you know, on the um, overhead, overhead, and uh, and type in sort of thing. Oh yeah, you know, and type in, and then you won't have to have the handwriting because we don't have days of the uh, yeah. the um, what do you call the slides? The uh, yeah, okay. 
Okay, yeah, you're right. Um, that tattoo could become that. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And so um, let, let me let me back up before I forget. One thing I wanted to mention is that Adrian had a great point. When you're using this, Donna, you want to first model it for them so so as to not confuse them. Okay. Model yeah. it. And then I would even say before allowing them to do it individually, maybe have a little time in class to have them work on it in, in like groups. Groups, small groups, yeah. And then if they get into it, you start using the the money, the um, the money that Adrian has, the um, the sticky note yeah. money. You can use that yeah. to sort of build a sense of competition. And then okay. hope, hopefully what I saw happen in some other classes is that students start competing with each other now. They're competing with themselves like, oh, last time I earned, I only got to twenty dollars or one hundred dollars. Oh, I'm going to get I'm going to get to, uh, you know, I'm going to get to five hundred this time. And that's okay. a very positive step if they can start get to that point, getting to that point to where they're actually competing with each other and with themselves, seeing how how because now they're paying attention to their thinking. Of course, the money thing, that's a tool to get them to do something else. But the important part, and I hope that you would emphasize to them, is look at how you're thinking now. Look at look at how your thinking has advanced about this particular topic. That's great. Thank you. Adrian, did I bring, did I send you anything else or those were the main two things? Those were the two things. Okay. And, and, and also I would encourage you, make sure you go over the diagram. And the whole point of the diagram, again, just to emphasize before we we uh, we end, is that the first the first column is their the goal that they're typically going to operate on. And just let them know they already have a goal in mind. Whenever we study something, whenever we go to study, we always study because we want to to learn something. There's a goal there. They may not be a no, don't know it, but most of the time that goal is a very it's a memory based goal. What is what is blank? What is that? In math, it might be, you know, do I know the steps for this? Can I identify the steps of this? And then that goal, whatever goal they have, is going to automatically trigger a type of thinking. And that type of thinking is going to happen regardless because it's all dependent upon the goal. But they need to know that however they think about that material, it's going to lead to certain outcomes. And the challenge for students is that when they get into courses like yours and memory and simply remembering um, lower level outcomes, the tests aren't testing for that then that's when students struggle because they feel like what like Adrian said, well, what I studied or what we went over in class wasn't on the test. And that's usually because the test is asking them for something much deeper. And the way they have to do that is they have to change their goal. And if they keep changing their goal from what is this, what is what are rational equations to why are rational equations important to can I create a rational equation? Can I analyze different steps of rational equations? Can I distinguish one type of rational equation from another type of rational equations? Then that might be, um, then that's a much more uh, useful way of, uh, of learning. And then I want to end, show you these, uh, where are they? These learning outcomes here Okay, is that in the PowerPoint? That is. That this is in the PowerPoint, so you'll have access to. This is the second PowerPoint. The and second one. All right. And then can how do, how do we how can I share that with people? Um all you have to do is you have access to the uh wiki, so you can just download them from the wiki. Uh-huh. And then you can just send them out to them. Okay. Okay. In an email format. But I just want to bring this up because this is the same thing. So this is just imagine um, just to, I want to make sure I'm very explicit with this. There's a huge difference between a student who is asking themselves, again, this metacognitive question that they often aren't aware of that's that's triggering their thinking. Can I list the four ways to factor polynomials from that's level one? That student is very different from the student who's asking the question, can I distinguish when I when I would use each factoring method? The student who is asking that second question is going to get a much deeper interaction just by the way they started the question than the student than the first student. Doesn't mean the first student is doesn't mean the first student is wrong. It just yeah. means that they're going to interact differently. Wow. 
Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so now I wanted to ask, I know we just have one teacher in here, mm -hmm. Donna, while you're on the phone. Yes. Um, like this level of interaction that we have was different from all other, all other level of interaction with Lenard. What do you think about that for some practical applications in working um, individually or in groups with like disciplines with faculty members for Lenard to come and do something like that with faculty? Do you think people would buy into that? Oh, um, I do. That kind of yeah, work? I do. And yeah. even like, like you said, you went to some colleges and got ideas by observing and some teachers were trying some of your um, the principles that they had learned from you um, and being able to apply that stuff and come back. Um, I just want to know if Donna thought maybe that would be worthwhile for absolutely. people actually. Absolutely, yes. I, I think it's absolutely worthwhile because well, you, you bring, brings a lot more to the conversation and into understanding. Really. It's like when the student of fairs in, we're going to attempt to run sort of the workshop format of this. But from the faculty end, it's really a matter of serious integration into the instruction and how do you best do that. And I think a lot, this meeting today probably hit home the most with how do I integrate that in my classroom. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Adrian, I'm glad you brought up that because I did feel after the last time I was up there that I didn't get a chance to do that as much just because of the setting and you have so many different the audience was so well last time we kind of ran into some time constraints when everybody did their introductions it cut into the time but um i i think if we did do something like that in the future what i would like to do is to sit down and work from syllabus creation from mm -hmm. what types of things need to be in the syllabus how to integrate that into the instructional delivery kind of strategically throughout and then how to assess along the way whether the degree to which students are advancing their thinking and how to align up assessment questions and test questions so that so that so, so that de whether it be departmentally or whether it be kind of individually but that folks are aligning the way that they want to evaluate with their teaching methods and their and their syllabi and those kind of things okay i, I want to throw that around to see how many faculty members would be interested to see if we can organize something like that. Um, I still have faculty that haunt us with certain struggles, the struggles they're having with their students in their classroom, yet how do I do X, Y, and Z? I'm not sure how to go to that next level. I'm not sure why they just don't get it. I'm doing this, this, and this, but my students aren't doing X, Y, and Z, and we're, how do they figure out how to tie that? Yeah. Together, um, effectively, for the learning the, process. The, the last thing I'll tell you, Adrian and Don, is that faculty are their worst. Faculty are their worst enemies, and here's why I say that. Oftentimes, we are our knowledge becomes our enemy. So. For example, there's a whole story that I'll, I'll tell maybe if I come back up there, but um, it's too long to tell now. Well, it's not that it's long, but it's just I know time is short. But because faculty so deeply know their material, when they write notes, they write it from the perspective of all of this background knowledge they bring to the table. So when they write their PowerPoints, guess what? Students don't read the PowerPoint like they read them. Because the students don't have this, they don't bring the same background, the depth of knowledge to it. So when faculty sometimes believe that, oh, I'm teaching straight from my from my notes, really they're not, because there's so much knowledge that they discount that their students don't have that um, that they'll ne they can never see the notes in the same way that their students see them in. Mm -hmm. There's a great study that I'll mention maybe at a later time that someone did about this that showed how um, how how this how this works. Yeah. Okay. Donna, do you have any other questions? Yeah. How did you pull up those faction polynomials in algebra? Yeah. Those. Oh, okay. How did you pull that up, though? Yeah, that was just on a PowerPoint, and I have them for some oh, other ones. And I have the PowerPoint. Okay. Thanks. 
Yeah, okay. Adrian, Adrian has a PowerPoint, so you can use those as kind of a guide. Different, different disciplines. So yeah. Different it's yes. great for all those levels. Yes. Yeah. That's very good. Thanks so much. Oh, you're welcome. Any other questions? I think that's I'm, good. I'm fine. Yeah. Well, well, I think ideally, Adrian, as you hit on, if we can get instructors sort of uh, some some strategies for them to use in the class that are very specific and that are that they can measure along the way. And then if we can get folks outside of the class and the support systems uh, reinforcing and helping in the same and everybody sort of working together on the same and rowing the boat in the same direction. And I think we'll see a lot of a lot of success in doing that. And I, I was thinking of maybe some summer work for people that a lot of people, more people have more classes, whether they're part time or full time in the fall and spring, but they oftentimes get ready in the summer. Some people are changing, they're going to change their class, they wait till the summertime to do it or whatever, yes. get a fresh start, get a little rest. Um, just like a lot of the high schools and elementary will have summer trainings or workshops um, to participate in. and our college and career readiness does a, um, um, I think it's with the common core standards, but they do some kind of summer um, workshop and training um, for the high school teachers yeah. too. Yeah. And a lot of faculty and staff from here participate in that, um, maybe turning it into an event for our faculty. I'm going to talk with Tony and Laura and them. Maybe we can do something joint and turn this into something that our faculty use in order to develop their courses and their way of thinking that's fresh going into the fall semester. Um, well, you're getting it from the beginning, you know, instead of coming in in the midterm doing something, you, you can think ahead and think out for the semester and how I'm going to do something different to help the learning process. For us. Well, you know, Adrian, that's a great point because, um, as you know, I've been working with the uh, state of Virginia's community college system. Yes. And I'm also uh, going to be flying to Louisiana to work with the state of Louisiana's community college system. Um, and one of the things that I found is that timing is very important because when you come right before the school year or when the school year is already in motion, people, they're already in, you know, survival mode. They're just, yeah, they're just trying to get it done. <laughs> but when you come during the summer and people actually have time, like I, 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 um, I started, I was invited now annually to do this um, teaching and learning institute for the Appalachia College Association. It's 32 colleges that are part of a consortium that we're a part of as well. And I did it last year for the first year and they invited me to do it again. Thankfully, I think I'm the first person they've ever invited back twice. Um, usually a person comes uh, every year. But one of the things that they benefited from, it's a week long institute that, you know, the ACA, all the provosts and all those people you know, all a part of it. And so it's a week long institute that they come to. And so for a whole week uh, this year, it's June 2nd through the 6th, where we go through and piece by piece work through all of these different steps. And people um, have been very responsive and they've seen some very um, positive differences in their in their students performance. And so uh, I'm coming back again to do it this year. But you're but the t I think the timing of it is so important because it's it's in it's in June. It's not rushed. They can take time. They eat. We hang out. We we talk and really hash out a lot of these things. So, um, so I, I'll definitely be interested in doing that. I think it would be useful. I'm thinking something like that. And just from my end in my area, um, at least I'd like to make teach out to the developmental ed faculty because okay. we have a lot of adjuncts to teach our developmental classes. They get the least amount of opportunity or time for um, preparations for their classes and support for their classes. Yet we have some of the um, media students, they're moving on into college level credit classes. If we give them the solid foundation to move their students into um, the transfer over credit classes, I think we can at least start there. And if other people want to come too, but I was thinking of that group as a start. Um, and maybe others. Well, it's, 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 I'm glad you mentioned that because um, I found what you know with this with this uh, state of Virginia thing, they've I've gone to different locations to meet with them. Um, man, I tell you what, 
their cha- it's, it's, it's part of the chancellors, the state of Virginia Chancellors Institute, I think it's called. And um, they are um, they have invested heavily in in their in their in their teachers because um, they have uh, they have these retreats and they've been at really nice places where they go out and they spend a whole week or sometimes a whole weekend. And I've been to three, three so far. And I have one more in April, I think, yeah, April 8th that I'll be going to. That's kind of the final one, the final symposium. And the thing that I like about it is that, you know, and, and I say this because I've heard this a lot, that the way that I, the Learn Well projects and the way it's presented is different from the other types of training that people see different in a good way. And so it takes a while to build up the background so that now when I meet, I've met with them the the second time and the third time that now we're at a much different place than we were in the beginning. And so now we can get much more practical, much more, you know, into exactly, you know, this is what we want to do here. Cause I haven't even talked to you about, for example, um, what I call, what I think one of the, one of the biggest challenges in teaching is that teaching students how to how to identify the organizing principles. So I'll, I'll leave you with this. If you think about any academic content that's complex as, as the things that we do, students have to have some way of organizing that material or else it becomes just everywhere. And so one of the things that educators can do to make that helpful, to make that more likely to happen with students is if they teach from the organizing principles as opposed to just teaching sort of the various content uh, things. And so I had this whole session where we talk about how to identify the organizing principles within a discipline. And if you teach those things and everything else hinges upon uh, students understanding of that. And so anyway, people find that very, very useful when they apply it in their class because their students now have a framework upon which to hang all the, you know, the content that they're going to get throughout the year on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, anyway, I know you all have things to do. Um, Good. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we'll talk. And yeah, do, uh, definitely stay in touch, Adrian. Don, if you ever need to contact me, feel free to contact me. I'd love to hear feedback on how things okay. are going for you. I will. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Adrian. Bye. Adrian, I'll send you this uh, recording as well this evening, so you can uh, share it with others if you would like to. Okay. All right. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Thank you. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.